Good afternoon, but also good morning and good evening to many of us. It's our pleasure to welcome you to our fourth and last webinar in the series of ITM alumni webinars featuring the ITM winners of the Prize for Global Research 2021. The prize is awarded yearly by the province of Antwerp to research projects of master after master students of ITM and other higher education institutes. Development relevance, quality and originality of the master thesis are key in the selection. Through this award, the province of Antwerp wants to stimulate research relating to the Global South. In, webinar, in the fourth webinar, MS Teha alumnus and laureate Hendrik Swanapool from South Africa will present his master thesis entitled A Scoping Review of Viral Diseases in African Ungulates. The main aim of this series of alumni webinars is to share research findings, expertise and experiences on a specific international health topic within the ITM community of alumni, students, staff, partner institutions, and the wider global health community. I will now briefly explain some of the practicalities of this webinar. If you want to ask a question, you can use a Q&A option you will have below your screen. You can ask a question anonymously if you would choose to do so. The chat is being disabled for questions. Questions will be moderated and only a select number of questions can be answered in live given the limited time. Unanswered questions cannot be answered individually afterwards for which we apologize. You can however use the forum function in the online alumni platform to start a discussion on your questions left after this webinar. At the end of the webinar, a short survey will be displayed and a browser window will open to give your feedback. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the ITM alumni platform. Our today's moderator is uh, Professor Melvin Kwan. He's associate professor at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, he has worked uh, since a long time on rapid diagnostic essays and the molecular epidemiology of African horse sickness virus. His current research interest is on the rapid diagnostics of viruses of veterinary, veterinary importance. Uh, he has also been uh, Hendrik's uh, thesis coach and he will be moderating the Q&A session afterwards. Melvin, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon, good morning to everyone uh, that is attending. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Henny Swanepoel. So Henny Swanepoel is a South African. He grew up here in South Africa, um, but then he went to Australia to Murdoch University, where he studied for a veterinary degree, which he obtained with high distinction. Uh, he's also the recipient of the Vice Chancellor's Award for Academic Excellence. Uh, we just found out recently that I attended the same school as he did. Um, where he got distinctions in all his subjects with an average of above 90% um, and was recognized as the Duck Scholar. Uh, over to you, Henny. Thank you, Melvin. I will just share my presentation and we'll get going. Uh, Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to present my thesis topic, namely a scoping review of viral diseases in African ungulates. Viral diseases are important in the African context because they can, in some cases, cause significant clinical disease in both wild and domestic animals, as well as in, in humans. Viral diseases make up a large proportion of emerging infectious diseases, and the management and prevention of these diseases have proven to be challenging, especially in the African context, due to large populations of reservoir hosts, which consist of African wildlife. At the time of undertaking this study, there were no comprehensive publications investigating viruses in African ungulates. The aim of the research study was to 
provide a scoping review of viral diseases which occur in free-ranging African angulates and identify knowledge gaps with regards to these diseases. The objectives of the study were set to be able to answer our research questions, which were firstly to list and describe viruses diagnosed in free-ranging African angulates. The second objective was to identify angulates affected by viruses. The third objective was to describe the geographical distribution of viruses. And finally, to identify viruses which appear to be understudied. The study was based on a scoping review of peer-reviewed publications pertaining to viruses and viral diseases in African angulates. The methodology for the scoping review was based on the guidelines as set out in the PRISMA extension for scoping reviews. Firstly, a search spring was developed and run in three major databases, namely Scopus, Web of Science, and Wildlife and Ecology Worldwide. And this provided a list of publications which were relevant to the research topic. These publications underwent a two-stage screening process using predetermined inclusion and exclusion criteria to obtain a final set of publications. The final set of publications then underwent data extraction and analysis. There were 145 publications which made up the final set of publications. The range of publication dates were from 1957 to 2018. There were 32 viruses identified in the publications with about nine viruses accounting for 74% of the reports. A bit more detail on, on all of these later. African elephant polyoma virus one was the only virus that was solely detected in captive animals. There were 50 African ungulates identified in the publications. The most frequently mentioned African ungulates were the African buffalo, the blue wildebeest, impala, and warthogs. The publications also originated from 18 of the 54 African countries. Frequently listed diseases were, or mentioned diseases, were foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, Rift Valley fever, blue tongue, and rabies. The infrequently reported diseases included lumpy skin disease, pestidesh petite ruminanche, African horse sickness, enzootic hemorrhagic disease, and a few others as listed. The results from the study showed that about a half of the publications that occurred or that focused on viral diseases in African angulates occurred during the last eight years, and hence confirming that there has been an increased interest in this field amongst scientists. In addition, a large proportion of the publications discussed viruses in free-ranging angulates with only about 5% of the publications discussing viruses detected in captive ungulates. This was an interesting finding because you would think that captive ungulates are easy to sample and report diseases in, but upon further investigation, the population of captive ungulates compared to that of their free-ranging counterparts is very small. And when captive ungulates or when wild ungulates become or are captured to become part of a, a captive ungulate population they undergo extensive testing and surveillance and if they do test positive to any disease they most likely won't form part of that captive collection. The viruses of significance according to the number of publications that reported on them were foot and mouth disease virus African swine fever virus, Alcelophine gamma herpes virus 1, and Rift Valley fever flavor virus. These four viruses accounted for more than 50% of the pub published research and reports on viral diseases in African angulates. Foot and mouth disease and African swine fever are two of the diseases of high interest 
due to their economic and political importance. However, neither are zoonotic. Zoonotic viral diseases such as Rift Valley fever and rabies are of high importance because of the disease they cause in, in humans. And these diseases of high interest generally stimulate public and political interest and will automatically attract funding for research. In comparison, some viral diseases which are exclusive to animals, which are listed as high impact diseases, example, African horse sickness and small ruminant morbidity virus has have significantly less research associated with them, likely due to the fact that they are of low economic, political and zoonotic interest, especially in the context of African wildlife. Naturally, foot and mouth disease virus had the largest number of publications reporting on it in Africa. Despite being significant based on research and its impact on the global economy, it is a virus which does not cause clinically significant disease in free ranging African ungulates. Obviously, the reason for foot and mouth disease receiving so much attention is that it is a highly trade sensitive disease. And this reflects that funding into disease research is often driven by economic and political agendas. In contrast, a virus such as rabies has a significantly smaller number of publications reporting on it in African ungulates despite causing widespread mortality and significant clinical disease, even in ungulates. And it also poses a serious zoonotic risk. Excuse me, in Henry. In case of African Henry? swine fever virus. Hendrik, I'm yes. sorry, your, your slides aren't following. So it's blocking somewhere, apparently. Is it stuck? Yes. It, you are still on the discussion cons, content. Continue. Con yeah, continue. Yes. Um, yes, okay. that's fine. I'm just discussing a few of the, the viral Okay, diseases. all right. Yes, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the... So in the case of African swine fever virus, years of funding and research have provided very limited effectiveness in reducing outbreaks of the disease. And at the time of writing, there were two major outbreaks occurring across Europe and Asia. These were mainly driven by the increase in easier global travel, trade in pork being legal and illegal, and poor biosecurity measures. Alcelophine gamma herpes virus, which causes uh, malignant catarrhal fever, is, uh, was reported frequently, um, but causes very few clinical cases of disease in wild ungulates. The reason for malignant catarrhal fever or alcelophine gamma herpes virus, one being reported frequently, is most likely due to its importance in, in the agricultural industry where malignant catarrhal fever is commonly transmitted from blue and black wildebeest to cattle. Rift Valley fever flavor virus is definitely a significant virus in the context of human, livestock and wildlife health and deserves to be listed as one of the viruses with, which had a high number of publications reporting on it. As an example, in 2010, there was an outbreak of Rift Valley fever in South Africa, and the first case was reported in January 2010 in the Free State Province, and by the end of the outbreak, the disease had been reported in, in the majority of the provinces of the country. The government had reported 237 confirmed human cases, of, with 26 of these cases which unfortunately died from the disease, and large numbers of animals, including sheep, goats, cattle, and wildlife, were affected. Given this information, it is evident that Rift Valley fever is of significance and it has the potential to become a global emerging disease if one health management strategies are not implemented to manage it. Two 
viruses of interest and which are noteworthy were African elephant polioma virus one, which was detected or diagnosed about eight years ago in captive African elephants. It has not since been reported on and obviously has not been detected in wild populations of African elephants, but may be a virus of interest to monitor either through passive or active surveillance in um, wild African elephants. In addition, Akabani orthobunia virus was shown to have a, or was detected in white and black rhinos. And despite the virus not causing cl uh, significant clinical disease in adult animals, it may cause abortions and congenital defects. And therefore ongoing surveillance and research dedicated to investigating Akabani orthobunia virus and its relationship with black and white rhinos may be of interest to the conservation of these endangered species. A wide variety of African ungulates were affected by viruses. And as mentioned earlier, the top four ungulates were the African buffalo, blue wildebeest, impala, and warthog. African buffalo accounted for about 17% of diagnosed viruses and viral diseases in African ungulates and was the ungulate which um, had the most viruses diagnosed by far. The African buffalo was susceptible to 16 of the 32 viruses mentioned in the study. And the most likely reason for this is that the African buffalo is widely spread across Africa and they are easy to study because they can easily be found and immobilized to collect samples. The blue wildebeest represented approximately 7% of publications reporting on Alcelophine gamma herpes virus 1. And this confirms the relationship between blue wildebeest and Alcelophine gamma herpes virus 1, with the blue wildebeest being the reservoir host for this virus. Impala represented about 6% of diagnosed viruses in African ungulates. And the most likely reason for this is the relationship to the spread of foot and mouth disease virus, which was obviously commonly reported. And Impala also widely spread across Africa, at least Sub-Saharan Africa. And finally, warthogs also represented about 6% of diagnosed viruses in African ungulates. The most likely reason being that the warthog is seen as the um, reservoir host for African swine fever virus. And despite it being challenging to isolate African swine fever virus in warthogs, and the relationship is not completely understood. Of, there's obviously still a lot of research going into African swine fever. In terms of the geographical distribution of viruses, all the studies that were identified or that formed part of the study indicated or originated from sub-Saharan Africa. The most likely reason for this, and from that um, map, it can be seen sort of the highest densities of uh, uh, publications originating from each country. And the most likely reason for the distribution of the origin of publications is the concentration of research in institutions and the availability of funding in each of these geographical regions and in each country. And in terms of the viruses which seem to be understudied, a clear knowledge gap was highlighted or identified in research focusing on lumpy skin disease virus, small ruminant morbidity virus, and African horse sickness virus. The reason for the underreporting of research on these diseases may be due to the difficulty of their surveillance for disease in free ranging African ungulates, and also that they might not be diseases of high economic or political importance. There were several limitations which affected this research study. In the first instance, it was predisposed to database bias because obviously only three multidisciplinary databases were interrogated. 
It was predisposed to publication bias, spatial bias, and geographical bias. In addition to this, constraints were also put into place to maintain a practicable scope for the, for the study. The importance of viral diseases in terms of economic, health, and conservation impacts were not quantified. Furthermore, free-ranging ungulates versus semi-captive ungulates versus captive ungulates were not distinguished in three categories because during the search, it was not possible to set three categories and hence only two categories, namely captive and free-ranging ungulates were set. Given the limitations of this, this research study, it should be kept in mind that the findings presented in this discussion indicate the perceived emphasis placed on different viruses in the literature and should not, not be perceived as the incidence or occurrence of viral diseases in African ungulates. In fact, a sound knowledge of the ecosystem dynamics for many multi-host viral diseases is deficient, and therefore it would be recommended that research be performed in this field, including the quantitative research focusing on viral diseases in African ungulates, and to further clarify the role of wildlife in the epidemiology of these diseases, and to provide evidence of the importance of these diseases at the wildlife livestock interface. In conclusion, there were a variety of viruses which were de de detected and diagnosed in African ungulates, and all the African ungulate species which were identified in publications had one or more viruses or viral diseases, diseases associated with them. The findings of the study should hopefully be valuable to policymakers, funding bodies, researchers, and any other stakeholders who need an understanding of viral diseases in African ungulates. Research opportunities in this field will also allow them to make informed decisions about investment in future research projects and health policies and protocols. The, the recommendations which arose from the study are that governments and research institu institutions offer more funding to investigate and report viral diseases of greater clinical and zoonotic significance, such as rabies and Rift Valley fever, also to adopt appropriate One Health approaches to investigate, control, manage, and prevent disease, and to focus more attention on diseases which may threaten the conservation of certain wildlife species. Viral diseases are of great significance and require extra attention in the future as they make up a large proportion of emerging infectious diseases and can often infect multiple hosts. Hence, the viruses and viral diseases diagnosed in African ungulates are of significance, particularly at the wildlife-livestock interface, and many of them have the potential of becoming emerging wildlife diseases. Thank you very much for your time, ladies and gentlemen, and any questions are welcome. Thank you, Henny. Uh, I'm starting my video. Just... Okay, so I think uh, there's some questions from the, the audience. Uh, so uh, the first question was, which scoping research tool did you use? Um, scoping research tool? Well, we, we set out the um, uh, search string amongst the research group. And we followed the guidelines as set out in the PRISMA extension for scoping reviews. Um, I, I can tell you the exact, um, give me one sec.
Yep, so it's the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. And that has an extension for scoping reviews, which sort of sets out a step-by-step -step, um, list and criteria that need to be, to be met for scoping reviews. And once we have the publications, we um, used EndNote to, um, I guess, um, filter through them all and then do the sort of title and abstract screening and then full text screening. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think that does. Um, another question was that uh, Rift Valley fever flebovirus was mentioned as a potentially dangerous emerging zoonotic disease. Would there therefore need to be more research here? Yes, I, I think um, there should be more research into especially something like Rift Valley fever virus, because it is not only a significant disease in animals, but can definitely spill over in humans. And as mentioned in that example with the outbreak in 2010, um, there were actually several or quite a few cases of 237 human cases, and some of which had died from the disease. In speaking about research into Rift Valley fever, fl uh, flebovirus, I actually came across a paper last night um, with quite a recent development in the vaccination of or against Rift Valley fever. But I think at this stage, um, well, that paper particularly, I've actually got, got it here, was discussing the vaccination of Rift Valley fever in for sheep or pregnant use. So it's still quite limited in terms of the use of the vaccine. And at this stage, I don't think there's any um, human vaccinations available. And some of the vaccines that are available are quite, or have quite significant side effects. Um, so obviously further research into the management, prevention, and possibly vaccinations would be quite quite suited. I, I don't know if you have any more information on that, Melvin. You're probably a bit more up to date with. Um, yeah, I'm with not that. sure which um, which vaccine what paper this is. Yeah, the the paper it was. I know we have the in South Africa we have the Clan 13 vaccine, um, but I don't know now. Okay. Yeah. Another vaccine that we're talking about. Yep. So the Clan 13 is supposed to be safe for use in pregnant animals. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so another question, would you say economic and political pressure drive the majority of the research? Um, and some emerging viruses such as those affecting conservation of animals is thus under researched? Yes, I, I think um, just going by the fact that foot and mouth disease was a, a disease which was quite um, or was mentioned in a lot of studies. I think that in itself indicates that um, there's a lot of economic and political pressure that drive disease research because as mentioned, foot and mouth disease is not zoonotic and it doesn't actually cause significant clinical disease, well, especially in, in African wildlife. But then there are definitely some diseases, especially such as lumpy skin disease and small ruminant mobility virus, which seem to be understudied. And one of the recommendations in, in my research study was to potentially consider creating a additional um, category to the um, World Organization for Animal Health list of diseases or the OIE listed diseases namely um, wildlife diseases, which may have an impact on the conservation of species. I know the OIE list of diseases focuses more on the trade of, or diseases which affect trade, hence, once again, indicating that there's an economic driver. But I, I believe that diseases which may affect the conservation of certain wildlife species should be just as important as diseases which may affect the economic um, 
drive behind diseases. Uh, another question. Why do you choose a scoping review over a systematic review and meta-analysis? Yep. So in terms of the data that we were um, wanting to extract from the from these studies, a scoping review was uh, more appropriate because we were synthesizing um, data and trying to identify knowledge gaps. We did initially investigate using a meta-analysis, but a meta-analysis um, from our research was probably more appropriate for quantitative analysis. And the scoping review, which I undertook, was more qualitative analysis of data rather than a quantitative analysis. Yeah, because we try to look at outbreaks and outbreak sizes. Yes. Um, and data, and there wasn't much of that information available. Correct. Yeah, it was, I think, especially in the published literature, it was quite, um, there were only a handful of studies that actually mentioned outbreak sizes. And to be honest, a lot of the published literature was surveillance studies. So it wasn't necessarily um, an outbreak study as such. And we didn't have information such as um, sort of the total population compared to the population of infected animals, et cetera, et cetera. So it was quite difficult to get um, quantitative data out of the publications. Uh, further question, did you seek collaboration from other reviewers or you conducted the review process on your own? Um, so purely because of uh, limitations in time resources and um, I guess due to the resources we had available, the Sorry, what was the question exactly? Uh, but did you use, look for oh, other the review reviewers? process? Yep. So no, we didn't use external reviewers for the dissertation itself. It was um, that we were a team of of well, it was Professor Kwan, Dr. Crawford, uh, Yanni Crawford, and myself, and we uh, conducted the review process on our own. The my dissertation findings were actually we wrote a paper and it was published and obviously for that process there were external reviewers which um, reviewed the paper they didn't necessarily um, aid in the review process but they did review the paper um, but we did do quite thorough work during the review process you you did the initial work through with uh, doing the literature search and correct um, putting getting the well doing the literature search and getting rid of duplicates um, yes. and then screening the abstracts and yep, so yeah sorry carry on yeah so then you screened the abstracts and excluded those that weren't relevant. Um, yep. And then the ones that were relevant, you obtained the PDFs. Yep. And then we all sat together. Yes. So it was almost a three step review process because, well, yes, I did a, a title and abstract screening process and duplicate screening. And then once we had the final set of publications, we obtained all the full text, or actually before the final set, we obtained the full text. Uh, publications for any articles that we thought were relevant and then the three of us reviewed those full text articles and obtained our final set from that okay further questions uh where does most of the research funding come from for one health virus studies at present um i think well that would depend on probably the country so I think, for instance, I don't, to be honest, I don't know sort of in the general terms, but for instance, in my case, um, we had some funding from the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember the exact. 
Äh, wieder. Tell you exactly where our funding came from. But I think a lot of the funding would, well, is definitely from probably government as well as non government organizations. Um, but yes, I, I don't know in sort of general how or where all the funding, funding comes from. But for instance, for my research project, it was from the Belgian Directorate. Um, general for development cooperation um, which is an agreement which is between uh, i think belgium and south africa the university of pretoria specifically yes um another question is that i lately joined the meeting if possible could you explain how did you collect gray lit gray literature for the review Yep. Um, so I guess how how we um, collected literature for the scoping review specifically was to set up a search string, and the search string um, obviously included specific um, search terms, which were the African angulates, and then we had um, specific terms to search for viruses and Africa. And that provided, I think, provided us with 346 publications in total, which then underwent the screening process. And we ended up with 145 publications in the final uh, list of publications. But correct me if I'm wrong, the, the databases we used would only reference um, published Articles, so scientific. Yes, we didn't we? Yeah, we didn't search for grey literature. So oh, yeah. non sorry. non scientific publications. No, so the yes, sorry, I missed the grey literature. Yep, yeah, correct. So the scoping review was based on published literature only, um, or peer reviewed publications only. Um, I know there's other databases, for instance, the uh, WAHIS uh, database, which obviously have disease notifications. And I think if we used, for instance, a database like that or gray literature, it might have changed the geographical distribution of diseases a little bit, but I don't think the overall um, number of public or the overall sort of standings of the diseases reported would have changed. I think foot and mouth disease probably still would have been the one that was highest or mostly reported. And there might have been subtle changes, but I don't think it would have changed sort of greatly. Yeah. Um, did you have full article access to all the publications? Um, so to the 145 publications that formed part of the final list of publications, yes, uh, we obtained full access to all of those. Um, and we used the library services at the University of Pretoria to obtain some of them or, well, because um, I was obviously studying through the University of Pretoria and ITM, a lot of the access was granted because we had, I guess, library access. And some of the publications that we weren't able to obtain, um, one of the team members that is specializes in data collection that works at the University of Pretoria Library were able to obtain the small number of um, full texts, which we didn't have access to. Okay. Um, which research question would you like to tackle next? Your top priority. <laughs> um, well, I would be quite interested in possibly doing a bit more research into um, Rift Valley Fever flavovirus, which is obviously a disease which has a more far-reaching effect and is probably uh, significant in the in terms of one health. Either that or 
potentially diseases which may affect the conservation of wild species, especially endangered species. And there's quite a few um, examples where wild animals or populations have been driven to, sort of to the brink of extinction due to um, some viral disease. Well, not just viral disease, but viral disease being one of them. A good example is the Ethiopian wolf. Um, and I think even the African wild dogs often have distemper outbreaks. And that's, um, I think, quite an important topic to tackle. Yeah. Following on on that, um, do you think these viruses then play a role in the ecology of of um, these populations. Um, so you could argue that that maybe these wild dog populations weren't healthy when they got distemper or um, <laughs> well I, I think it's more to do with the presence of of humans and our domesticated animals because I think we've grown the human population have grown to a point where there's almost not enough space on the planet for all of us, as well as all the animals. And because we sort of invading, or I guess invading or taking up more space and our the animals that come with us also occupy that space. And there's more interaction between humans and domestic animals and wild animals and agricultural intensification. I think that's why there's an overflow of diseases that weren't necessarily seen in African wild dogs before. And there might have been cases of distemper in African wild dogs in the past, but when there were less domesticated dogs and humans sort of in close contact with them, there might have just been small isolated cases that uh, caused a uh, population of them to, to die out. But the rest of the population, I don't think would have necessarily been affected. But I think because we sort of pushing them into smaller areas and the higher density of population populations living in the same area, I think that's probably the main driving factor behind it. Great. Um, how long did the review process take you? Um, it, well, my thesis spanned over two and a half years and that obviously I didn't um, commit all that time to the review process, but we did our first literature search in January 2019, and the paper was published, or the my dissertation was published, um, I think, at the start or middle of 2020. So I'd say about 18 months in total. But you were still, you were working as a veterinarian. Yes, yes. So it's, I guess it's difficult to quantify the exact number of hours, but yes, between full-time work and the thesis and part of the course was also um, structured modules. So that also required time and it wasn't all just thesis based. I think if, if it was only the thesis and um, I wasn't working and wasn't um, doing additional modules, it probably would have been, I'd say, six to 12 months max. And just for the benefit of the audience, uh, what was your MSc degree? What it was? Tropical Animal Health. Yep, it is the Masters of Science in Tropical Animal Health. And then just quickly explain how, how this course is structured or what it involves. I don't know who the audience is. Actually. So I don't know. If they know. Yeah, so you just mentioned the structured courses and then the research projects. Yep. Okay. Are there any other questions? If they're not, I'm going to ask Kenny a few. Um, yes. So you mentioned the zoonotic diseases such as rabies and Rift Valley fever. 
Yep. But you also get important non zootic diseases, yes. such as PMD. So, where should resources be allocated? Are zoonotic diseases more important than non zoonotic diseases? What is your mm, not, not necessarily. Um, obviously, zoonotic diseases are important in the context of, of human health. But as mentioned earlier, I think some of the non zoonotic diseases, which may affect the conservation of wildlife species are important in the context of wildlife, whether it be in Africa or Europe or um, Australia or America. And I think some of the resource allocation depends on the institute allocating those resources. Um, obviously, if I think from a government perspective and human health um, institutes zoonotic diseases will be more important and probably will require more funding from them um, as opposed to for instance um, branches of the IUCN or um, institutes looking after the conservation of wildlife across the globe um, I think they'll probably allocate resources which look at the conservation of those species and diseases which may affect that so why is so take foot and mouth which um doesn't see doesn't affect there's not well it's not a, a disease which affects a race well that many rare species mm -hmm. uh, but enormous resources are allocated to it and it's a very economically important disease yes but it doesn't cause very severe disease in animals no. So why why is it such an important disease? <laughs> I well, I think that's a bit beyond the scope of, of the study, but to be honest, I I don't know exactly why foot and mouth disease attracts so much research and funding because well, firstly, it definitely doesn't cause any disease in humans, and secondly, it causes some morbidity in animals, but, but not much. I think it's more a disease which allows global markets to maintain their sort of a hierarchy. And yeah. some countries, obviously, I'm working in, in Australia at the moment. Australia is free of foot and mouth disease, but they, and because of that, they can export their animals because they do live export as well as exporting meat. To anywhere in the world so they able to maintain that market access thanks to foot and mouth disease which if foot and mouth disease wasn't there i think there's a lot of countries which the economies would be very different because of the trade in in meat and meat products and i think um the politicians might be able to better answer <laughs> that question for us but and uh, so are you saying that research resources are allocated to economically important diseases rather than diseases that severely affect animals? I think in some instances, yes, because um, I guess in the case of African swine fever, that does have quite a significant impact on the health of animals and it can, or it causes significant mortalities and morbidity. And African swine fever attracts a, a, quite a significant amount of funding. But once again, it does also have an economic and political driver. So I think overall, just because of the how money flows around the world, I think diseases which have economic and political importance generally tend to attract more funding. I think the there's starting to be sort of, there are changes which are starting to take place because I think people are realizing that without the natural world, it will be difficult to maintain our existence. So I think there's definitely a change in the focus a bit more towards the conservation of wild spaces, not only wild animals, but wild spaces and biodiversity, especially in order to help sort of maintain the globe as such rather than just a certain species or humans because 
if there's no sort of wild spaces or no planet for us to live on, then no one's going to exist in the end. Yeah. So you mentioned African swine fever. Um, so that's a disease that spread from Africa to other parts of the world. Um, yes. There are other diseases that this has also happened, such as African horse sickness, yep. a blue tongue, rift valley fever. Um, so what went wrong with African swine fever and how do you control, control it, the this, this spread outside its endemic areas? Yep. Um, in terms of uh, how it spread, well, the, the way it spreads is the most common way it spreads and outside of Africa with the absence of warthogs or wild sewers is through um, pigs or swine or um, yeah, pigs being fed animal products or having access to animal products. So I think um, a biosecurity, from a biosecurity point of view, there was probably a breakdown. And then also the ease of global travel has probably stimulated that sort of spread outside of, of Africa. In terms of how to control it, um, I think the first step would be to have better um, biosecurity measures. So any food products which contain pork um, should not be fed to, I guess, other pigs. And well, I think a lot of it comes down to creating awareness and education, because I think if you ask the general or walked up to someone in the street and asked them if they knew how African swine fever spread, no one would know. Whereas in countries and a lot of European countries and Asian countries, pork is a protein that is quite commonly consumed. And if you are on a picnic, for instance, eating a pork sandwich or a sandwich with ham in it, and you didn't eat half of it and left it there, um, and wild animals had access to it, what, um, African swine fever could easily spread from that. So I think education and biosecurity are quite important ways to try and curb or mitigate the risk of spreading diseases such as African swine fever. Okay, there's a few more questions from some of the attendees. So I don't know if you can answer this. The WHO prioritized 20 diseases to be targeted to achieve the sustainable development goals, yep. among which seven are zoonotic. So do you think there are other diseases that have been missed to be considered in this list? So I don't know if you know which are the diseases that... Um... I am not familiar with the whole list of diseases, but I'll, I can quickly look it up. Um, Okay, um, well, I can look that up. Um, yeah. I can ask you the next question. Yes. Um, does the potential to become zoonotic play a role in funding virus research? Was this difficult to assess? Um, well, I think, for instance, in the case of Rift Valley fever, I, I think initially that was not necessarily classified as a zoonotic disease until outbreaks took place. So I, I think one step back, it is probably difficult to assess which diseases may become zoonotic or not. But I think once there has been evidence that it may be a, a disease of zoonotic importance, then um, I think naturally it will um, attract more funding because obviously the the aim of a lot of well i guess um, the main aim is to promote human health and once a disease does pose a risk to to human health it naturally will and should attract funding but yes i i think it is sometimes difficult to accurately assess which diseases may or may not be zoonotic i don't see what the can't find this list. Um, I think we are almost out of time, though. 
Um, I don't know who asked that question, if they can maybe can um, they speak? I don't possible? know. I don't think the attendees. It's an anonymous question. So if the person could say who he is, we can unmute him and then. Uh... <laughs> I don't see, uh, yeah, I don't know where this list is. I don't see it very quickly. Ah, voila. The yeah. list is in the, in the Q&A box. Oh, okay. Can you see yeah. it? Can you? Yes, the echinococcus, kind of okay. foodborne tremidiasis, even African trypanosomiasis. Well, I can uh, think of non-viral things that could possibly be on that yes so i was i was about to say there's and yeah there's a lot of non-viral diseases but um just off the top of my head and i can't um are there any more there's four five six yes yes rabies yeah. So, what's up? Do you think risk for any fever? Yep. Uh, well, that's why I was waiting for the full list. But for instance, I think rift belly fever should probably be included on that. That's zoonotic, zoonotic, and um, it obviously is endemic to tropical regions. But if the climatic conditions are right, um, it can easily spread. And I guess once again that. The big outbreak of Rift Valley fever in South Africa in 2010. It was the first time in the history of outbreaks in South Africa that Rift Valley fever was actually detected in a winter rainfall area, namely the Western Cape. It usually occurs in tropical areas, but in that case, because of um, agricultural intensification and um, there being more water bodies around with dams being built and slight changes in the climate, the disease actually spread to a non-tropical area. So I think, for instance, Rift Valley fever is probably an important one to be on that list if it's not already. Um, I'm surprised something like tuberculosis is not on that. Yeah, but I don't know if, if we have the full list there because it says prioritize 20 diseases. Uh, okay, that's good. Yeah. Well, you, you get human TB and then you get bovine TB. So yes. Maybe it's is the human TVs on there. I think we've got come to the end of our webinar. Um, so I think I must hand over back to Charlotte. Yes, well, it's now just a closing word. Huh? I just want to thank Hendrik for presenting and sharing his research, research insights and findings. Uh, together with you, Melvin, as well, uh, for um, the interactive and enriching moderation of the webinar. Also, thanks to Mika for managing uh, the questions and to E for uh, the technical support and assistance. Um, of course, you participants from around the globe, thank you for attending the webinar and for uh, engaging um, in the Q&A uh, with your questions. Also, thank you for completing the short survey, which will be displayed uh, shortly after. We will be back next year with new alumni webinars. In the meantime, I would just say stay safe and healthy, and we wish you all the best for a healthy 2021 in the meantime. Thank you to all, and looking forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.